Hello there. My name is Tiaren Gruber and I use she, her pronouns. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Level Up Symposium presented by the Associated Designers of Canada with support from Toaster Lab's Mixed Reality Performance Atelier. I'm a member of the board of the uh, directors of the ADC and I'm really excited to be your host for today's panel discussion, Beyond Reality. To begin our session today, I would like to acknowledge that I am currently located on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional land of First Nations and Métis people. Edmonton, as it is known colonially, is and has been home to a diverse range of Indigenous nations and peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Sutsina, Inuit, and many others. Since time immemorial, this land has been a meeting place for this diverse range of Indigenous peoples who enrich this place with their histories, languages, and cultures. As a settler, I have benefited from Indigenous generosity, hospitality, and knowledge. And for that, I wish to express my sincere gratitude. In this spirit of gratitude, I would also like to acknowledge the support of Canada Council for the Arts, our primary funder for the symposium as a whole, as well as our dedicated member volunteers and volunteers on the board of the ADC who have made this symposium possible. Thank you so much. We're equally grateful to these additional sponsors, IATSE, University of British Columbia, Theatre Alberta, CITT Alberta Chapter, Concordia University, Ryerson University, and York University. Thank you. For your information, all symposium events will be recorded and presented in a freely available archive. Check back a few days after any event you've missed to see the recording at levelup.designers.ca. Thank you for joining us today. You are watching this Level Up live stream either on the Level Up website, levelup.designers.ca, or thanks to our partners at Toaster Lab on HowlRound at HowlRound.com, or on the respective Facebook pages for the ADC or Toaster Lab. Regardless of your viewing platform, embedded on the same page as this video is the chat function in the top right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, questions can be asked in the chat at any time and will be read out to the presenter during the Q&A portion of this panel. If you have any technical difficulties at any point in the session, please send an email to levelup at designers.ca for immediate support. This event can be enjoyed through auditory or visual access or a combination of both. I will read aloud all questions we address from the chat and this information will also appear visually at the bottom of your screen. Visual access is also supported with captioning for many of our speakers. Captioning will appear directly below the active speaker um, if you require technical assistance to support your access, please email levelup at designers.ca for immediate support or to provide feedback, which is greatly appreciated uh, following any of our events. If you enjoy this session, please consider donating any amount to the Associated Designers of Canada to support our National Arts Service Organization achieve its goals in the areas of advocacy, mentorship, and industry promotion. Donation links are available uh, in screen on all viewing platforms, and I hope you'll consider donating. Thank you so much for your patience with our announcements. Today's panel discussion, Beyond Reality, features the following artists, Ian Garrett, S.B. Proctor, Beth Cates, and Paul Sigis. Uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Ian Garrett. He'll be today's panel moderator. Welcome, Ian, and thank you so much for leading us through this conversation today. Thanks, Erin. Uh, I think that my connection might not be the best right now, which keeps happening to me. That, um, uh, I did a presentation yesterday where it slowed up, so I might change that in a moment. Can you give me a thumbs up if you're hearing me okay? Or getting my video okay? Okay. It looks like my video might be jammed up a little bit. I look very com uh, com contemplative in uh, my setting there. It doesn't look like my captions are necessarily coming across, but hopefully it will resolve itself. Um, uh, as we get started, um, I'll give a little bit of uh, context for where we're coming from um, uh, and then come back, hopefully with better video when we come back for the for the conversation. I'll get it sorted. Um, Great, thanks, I was working Ian. just before this. Uh, so Toaster Lab is a small uh, mixed reality performance production company. We're based in Toronto, um, uh, where we're seated, uh, seated on the land uh, of the Haudenosaunee here on Wendat. Uh, Meti and uh, the uh, Anishabe. And um, we do a lot of, we've been working through this two year deep dive on uh, through the Toaster Lab Mixed Reality Performance Atelier, where we've been looking at performance practices that integrate mixed reality with live performance. And this started before we got into 
our current pandemic situation. Um, a lot of it has uh, become much more relevant in that case. And um, of the artists that we're talking to today, all of whom have started to approach this uh, topic of where do we sit at this intersection of a scenographic uh, theatrical design practice and the integration of mixed reality um, in a couple of different things. Everybody here also is part of actually the advisory board for that project, for that atelier. And through that, we've been boosting up, um, uh, well, we've been boosting up uh, uh, a number of different projects. We're looking at having done 18 to a couple of dozen by the time we get to the end of it in June uh, and have been having regular convenings. And it just so happened uh, that uh, along with being a member of the ADC board uh, with, uh, with uh, Aaron, uh, that um, uh, we've been uh, we've been we were having a convening that was going to be scheduled about the same time through our series of six convenings that we're having through that project. Uh, so we're really uh, grateful to be here and really uh, happy to be supporting uh, Level Up and, and all of the different back end. I don't know that it looks like my connection might be starting to actually catch up. Maybe I'll catch up by the time that I get uh, that I'm presenting as well. So I want to uh, introduce. Um, a number of illustrious people that I've had a great pleasure of talking to quite a bit about these topics and working with over the years, uh, the last couple of years as well um, through various uh, networks. We're gonna do uh, some short presentations before we get into, um, uh, into a conversation, which we hope that people will present, uh, 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 participate with through the chat that we will start with some leading questions as well. Oh, there we go. There it is. It caught up eventually, um, and uh, and uh, it, it's important to understand what exactly it is we're even talking about. I find that this idea of mixed reality performance um, really puts us in a position where it could be any number of things. And I think that one of the reasons that I think it's important to see what each of us are working on is actually see that we're coming at it from slightly different ways. So the, the flow should work so that there's some idea of how we work from one project to the next, um, but that everybody is bringing in different skills, different technologies and working together um, uh, and with different aspects of performance and supporting different aspects of performance so that it is, um, uh, it's really uh, a convergent field with many different things coming together and then a divergent field and the number of opportunities. Uh, but it's not like um, lighting design, a lot of us have had some, it, 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 or, or sound design, which a lot of us had some experience with, where we're dealing with sort of a preset uh, notion of a, like how we're trying to express uh, dramaturgical information through design uh, that um, we still haven't got there yet. All right, so the order that we're gonna go in and I'll introduce the, uh, our panelists up front, but I'll put it into the order in which we've sort of uh, agreed ahead of time. First, we're gonna hear from Beth Cates. Uh, Beth is a self-taught and award-winning lighting. Uh, hi, Beth, nice to see you. There you are. Um, so uh, I'll introduce everybody and then we'll, we'll come up. Uh, so Beth is a self-taught, award-winning lighting projection set and costume designer, uh, and she's been working in uh, rock and roll since she was 14. Um, she's the creative director of Playground Studios uh, that has done a number of interactive installations, and she recently completed her master's at University of Calgary in drama uh, uh, and um, has been working on performance and performance creation at the intersection with digital technologies at... Uh, at uh, of virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, and that is a, extended from an in-person pr performance called Bury the Wren and to uh, fully uh, immersive VR social experiences that we'll talk, that I think we'll hear about today um, and the development of uh, projects that are integrating some of those technologies into uh, um, what we would ex assume to be more of a what we expect out of a stage performance. And so there's the whole hybrid range of the ways in which these VR technologies have been um, integrated into Beth's work that um, has different levels of engagement. Uh, um, we're gonna wanna hear from uh, uh, Sada S.B. Proctor, um, who I'll be referring to as uh, S.B. most of the time, S.B. Um, 
uh, whose uh, background is as a sound designer, new media artist, and dramaturg. She's based in Brooklyn. Um, and she works across live, digital, and virtual forms of storytelling uh, through multimedia theater, audio dramas, virtual and augmented reality, and immersive experiences. Um, she and Beth were collaborators on uh, an immersive, fully VR uh, production as well. But she's also a really um, well-regarded VR filmmaker as well, and has been working on, from a filmic perspective of working with VR uh, of different types of immersive technologies as well. And then we're going to be uh, hearing from another practitioner who crosses over into a lot of the filmed VR realm as well, Paul Seges, whose uh, work merges multiple practices of performance creation and design from theater and opera to site-specific installation and intermodal mixed reality scenographies, which you've been completing or have completed. You'll, you'll update me uh, uh, a PhD on. Uh, I can't remember where you are within the, within the set of doing it. But uh, we also have a, a common background in sustainability. And he has his a, a MSc, Sustainability and Environmental Studies, as well. Uh, he's a co-creator of Blue Hour VR, which I know that we're going to see a little bit today, a site-responsive mixed reality performance that premiered uh, in 2019 at the Prague Quadrennial. So we'll hear from each of you today. Beth, I'm going to turn it over to you to start things off um, and, and get us rolling. Absolutely, thank you. And it's really, we were all remarking um, as we arrived into the web browser, uh, how nice it was to see everyone. And I think we're all really missing uh, seeing each other. Um, so I'm, I'm dialing in across the, across the airwaves from, from Mokinsis, from Calgary. Uh, and I have a beautiful view of a beautiful sunny day. Uh, and I'm really, really grateful to be here. Um, I, I'm also a member of the Associated Designers of Canada and, um, and heavily involved with a whole bunch of different committees um, and was, I'm so thrilled that this is happening. I think this kind of knowledge exchange uh, is really critical. And, um, and so I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about the work that I've been doing most recently that um, I came to the University of Calgary, which is where I did my MFA in drama and computer science to look at the intersection of VR and AR and live performance. And I started this almost four years ago. So before the pandemic, before we entered into this hyper digital age that we now sit in. Um, and, and it's elicited a whole bunch of really uh, interesting connections across disciplines, which I think is something that I, I, I think all of us can speak to in this panel. Um, one of the pieces that is critical for this kind of work uh, is reaching across the disciplines and outside the silos and really looking at ways that we um, restructure and re, uh, redo uh, or dismantle entirely the hierarchy of how we've traditionally made theater, which is something that sits in a really interesting place in the digital realm. Um, I also, and I can't remember because things went by too quickly. I'm also a, a video projection designer. So all of this digital work comes from that. And I've been doing digital projection. We were using video on stage long before video had the capability to be easily brought onto the stage. So um, all of this contemporary work comes from all of that work uh, over the last 30 years. So I am going to do a little walkthrough because pictures are better than words sometimes. I'm going to share my screen and, uh, and share a couple of pieces of work with you. Um, so you've now all disappeared for me just so that the StreamYard folks know. Um, so this is me. Uh, this is a traditional piece of extended reality work. This is uh, Trina Davies' Silence. It was directed by Peter Hinton and Michael Gianfrancesco did the set design uh, and uh, was a fully immersive, uh, for the performers, a fully immersive experience. Um, so among all the other things, and this I find really important, and we are going to talk, or we're going to try to have some time to talk about real life. Um, so I am also a mom. Um, this is me nursing while focusing lights uh, and sitting at the production table with my son, Aaron, uh, who's now eight and a half years old and is with me all the time in theater. And I, I presence that and I say it to just because I know I've had conversations with a lot of our young 
artists and people who are starting in this challenging industry just to say you can have kids it's possible and it's awesome and then you can teach them how to do stuff and then they can help you edit video and things like that and that's really great um so uh digital extended reality work i'm going to touch on three of the most um recent projects which started with um uh, or didn't start with, but this was a piece that was done for the for Randolph uh, College in Toronto. Alistair Newton adapted a, a very old play um, and had adapted it, and then the pandemic hit, and then decided that he would readapt it for Zoom um, because he was never going to be in the in a physical space with the performers. Randolph um, set all the performers up with the the right kind of equipment. And we then basically did live off the floor, not live to air, but live off the floor recordings that were then either augmented in the moment or augmented um, in post um, to really flesh out what story we were telling and to really try to break the rectangle of Zoom. Um, and we stuck with just Zoom. We didn't go to OBS. We, we needed to stay simple because this was an early, this was the Randolph's first show of the season. And so what was beautiful about this was that um, integrating Zoom into the dramaturgy of the performance uh, helped us to bridge the gap of those rectangles and to really make it uh, have a, a, a high aesthetic, allow the aesthetic and the and the extended reality parts of the design to to leap through the screen as best as we could, given some very very short time frames um, and a lot of a lot of great support. Uh, so that uh, that was what we did, and and it was great because Alistair and I had worked on that as he was adapting it. So we were able to have really good, thorough discussions about what was possible, what would have impact, how could we work with the costume designer, uh, and so on. And then how could we then work with the actors too? What did they need from their backgrounds? And it was a really fruitful collaboration. Um, and it was really, it was very, very colorful. Um, which was which was thrilling. So the the piece that <clears throat> They Ian mentioned uh, in the my little introduction there um, is this piece called Bury the Red. So this was my uh, thesis central project for my thesis um, and was an active way to explore how we could bring together virtual reality, augmented reality, and live performance, or and what I call carbon reality, so the stuff made out of carbon. Um, and I created this with Neil Christensen. Um, we worked uh, in a devised method with the technology, which meant that the actors, um, Val Planche and Val Campbell, who helped to devise <clears throat> the script and the storytelling, um, <clears throat> we're working with the technology as we developed the show. And so as the audience it was a one-to-one -one performance and as the audience member, you are within another reality um, that we crafted while uh, the performer was with you in body only in the physical space. She never appeared as an avatar. She did have control though over the story that that she was telling. We used um, a process called photogrammetry to capture real world objects, the real world objects that we had actually used as the, the devising prompts. Um, and that was how she told the story. So it was object driven, design driven, performance driven. We were playing with the nature of reality, with the nature of liveness, presence, um, and really trying to experiment with how we could tell our ultimate goal was not to make like a big flashy super high tech show but our ultimate goal was to make a, a an affective and emotionally uh, a, an affective journey an emotional journey through the story and and the story was telling some of you in the audience might know about the Donnellys, which is an old, old, old piece of history uh, from Ontario of a family who was murdered and most of the women have been erased from the retellings of that story. This was an effort to also reclaim uh, that feminine voice. And so, um, uh, and then we used the, the 
AR, the augmented reality capacity of the headset that we chose, which was a Vive Pro, to introduce the, the human performer to the audience member mediated through the headset uh, until the final moment of engagement where the headset was removed by her. Uh, you were given an apple to eat and you had this final moment of pure human to human exchange once she was ready to reveal herself to you. Um, and so all of, all of that work too was really pushing um, the boundaries of what was possible with the technology. At that time, um, we had things develop as we, as we went along. We, and this is one of our dramaturgs. We invented ways of trying to dramaturg from within a headset. Uh, while you couldn't write anything down. We had to rehearse in computer science rooms because we needed the access to the technology, which was key to our process. Uh, so it was a, there was a lot of learning and a lot of exploration that happened. From all of that, that VR work, one of the things that I have been doing in the last year in particular, starting with um, Laval VR, so this is me as an avatar, um, because I once colored myself purple and got in trouble for it. So now I can be purple without getting in trouble. Um, and so starting with Laval VR, which was a conference that was very quickly shifted into virtual reality um, uh, with, with other members of a working group, um, which Paul is part of, um, I led these performance experiments where I had people engage with their avatars and create miniature performances using all the limitations that we had within this particular platform, a platform that was geared specifically towards conferences. So um, you could only dance if you hit, you know, like F1 and it would make you do Gangnam style. And then there were there were different ways you could move your avatar's body, but it wasn't intuitive and it was all through the keyboard. Uh, but what we ended up creating, the groups had about 20 minutes and what they ended up creating were works of, of physical performance in this virtual space. And we ended up with, um, the Kent Bai called it a happening. We had a happening in VR unintentionally um, that was performative and uh, performance driven. And it was a great deal of fun. And it has led to, um, there's, yeah, you can see how the avatars move there. It's, it was all very awkward and kind of, kind of fantastic. Um, this has led to other experiments, uh, starting at PXR, which is a performance in XR symposium. Um, and it, this is an embodied exercise. So you actually are wearing the headset. You are these avatars. You're physically able to pick up, move objects. Um, I, my goal with these was to experiment with <clears throat> how and what we could create in VR in real time with each other. So using collaborative devised methods um, and training people to be what I'm calling sonographers. In VR, they're often called terraformers, but people to actually, um, to actually be able to create space within the virtual space and then to create performance. And so there's two of these experiments have happened now. I now have a collection of all of these different sonographies in this world. Um, and each time we've managed to, in, in like 30 minutes, create full sonographies and full performances. And it's really exciting. And the capabilities of VR are improving all the time to allow for this. Um, and then in a much more focused way, um, and this is the piece that SB and I collaborated on, created by Kira Benzig of uh, I Studios. Um, this is a piece called Finding Pandora and all of these other amazing, incredibly talented visionary people. Um, this is me lighting in VR. My work on this piece, which was uh, is a piece of VR theater, so it's live performers in VR. You share the space with them in real time, and they tell you a story, just like when we used to be able to go to the theater. Um, in this case, we get to be in multiple worlds, and we get to experience multiple storylines. Um, so there's a, a threaded narrative 
Um, what my work on this was both as world lighting designer for Mount Olympus and live lighting designer. So we created a system with developers to allow us to control lights in real time in the virtual space, um, which we can, there's lots of questions to answer about that. Um, but it was a, a pretty extraordinary uh team effort um, and was a really interesting um, exploration into what exists right now and what really doesn't. Um, we did a lot of hacking of systems, building on top of other systems to make it do what we wanted it to do uh, and with great complexity. And in the live lighting system, I was able to light with three lights at the same time. So it also felt like being back in like Dam Straight or, uh, or Leary McNichols old studio where I could only plug in three lights at the same time. Um, and uh, and ultimately, the the piece went on to uh, to win a, a prestigious award at the Venice Biennale. Um, and uh, I've also since been the stage manager on it, and we've done some private presentations. And and we're all this group of people are all um, continuing to explore where we can go and what we need to go forward. So here you go. I will then pass the baton back to Ian. Go ahead and uh, continue on on that trajectory because we're talking Pandora X. And actually, quickly move us over to SB, um, who may be able to provide us another view on that, um, as, as well as your other work, especially the filmic work. Um, take it away, SB. Thank you. Um, I'm glad to be presenting in front of you all today. I'm going to be talking about previous projects that I've done in cinematic VR, um, and as well as as well as theatrical projects, and then what I'm currently working on in terms of more hybrid productions. So, um, oh. Actually, Ian, if we can just give a moment, because my um, my browser is actually not allowing me to share. It's a Firefox thing, I believe. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, do you want to? Should we? Should we just hop to Paul for a second, and we'll come back yes. to you? Yeah, yeah let's do that. So Easily much. done. Paul. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> um. I want to. There's something that came out of Beth that actually this seems like a good opportunity to mention is that like with all this yeah. new technology, we're devising a lot. I think about like you know yeah. I have a background in lighting and uh, I know you do too, um, and uh, like I remember getting trained. It's sort of like there's various conventions that you're just like okay, 45 degrees, and you're like at some point you interrogate it, but when we start to deal with these new technologies, it's like oh. I don't know. Let's just try something. Like it all requires that level of experimentation um, to get us through to figure out how to put all these things together. Um, that being that being said, you've done a lot of that. It I'm makes me turn think it over a little to, bit. Yeah, yeah that's, that, that's nice of you. It makes me think a lot about what are the transferable skills that we have from one industry to another as a designer. Uh, certainly, we're, we're both also teachers and a lot of the work we do. So thinking a little bit about how you can hop to different technologies um, and do the same skills to the same design principles apply. That's a question that I'm thinking a lot about, especially when I'm lighting in VR. I, <laughs> I love Beth's limitation of three lights. <laughs> it's, it's so true. And, and it asks us to you know, kind of go back to basics once again or to think a little bit about what, uh, what are the principles at play. So. Um, yeah, maybe we can. Um, we could just start uh, my um, presentation, uh, my screen share. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I, I mean, I was thinking a lot about this, and in in preparation for the panel today, I was um, was just kind of taking a journey back through my experience. Um, you know, just thinking a little bit about mixed reality, thinking about beyond reality, these these different words, and I was certainly thinking through my journey through technology for the most of it. Um, and thinking about technologies and how they give us ways of engaging with the world around us. This is, um, this is a, a, a part of, um, of the new age of, of engaging scenographically or with design. Um, and certainly how we think about technology is something uh, that's really fundamental. Um, 
I've always been interested in technology, um, you know, as I the kind of journeyed through. Um, you know, I, uh, I think back um, uh, to my work um, as a lighting designer and as a projection designer, and I've continuously been reliant on technology. Of course, usually someone else's technology, but technology nonetheless as a means of artistic expression. So this reliance on technology is not new. Um, and, you know, the accessibility of virtual technology is new. And that's what's, I think, bringing us all together today. And this development towards uh, greater accessibility changes the way in which designers can engage artistically and autonomously outside the system that we have been dependent on traditionally for so long. And so my brief talk today is really about um, accessible technologies. Um, this is especially pertinent today where we have lost um, our sense of personal agency in many ways. Um, and we've lost a sense of what uh, might bring us a tremendous amount of joy, like creating beautiful theater. Um, for me, designing has always been about two things, the exploration of my own artistic potential on one hand, and certainly as a means of leveraging design for social justice and environmental issues. When I go back uh, to old projects, um, I remember playing with live feed on stage uh, and how this radically changed the performance landscape for all of us, how it gave us new um, proximities to performance and um, to how performance spaces um, could be usually witnessed at a distance, but certainly became completely um, augmented. We, we all of a sudden could come in very close to the performance subject. Um, in 2013, uh, I began working on an intermedial opera um, that brought together quantum physicists, musicians, actors, and visual designers together to create a performance, an intermedial performance that explored human relationships with technology and the increasing domination of algorithms in our daily lives. Uh, this project was really important to me um, for my own on many different levels. Uh, it foregrounded design, certainly. Um, and it was almost a completely design-led process. And it explored the idea of being in multiple realities simultaneously. Since then, I've met um, a couple of different technologies along the way um, that have furthered this preoccupation I have with multiple realities. Um, 360 degree video, groundbreaking, um, and virtual reality headsets, such as the Oculus Rift. This opened up compelling new experiences of space between the real and the virtual, but it also fundamentally changed the means of producing. Um, I was able to have a greater autonomy as a designer and as a researcher. In fact, um, I now consider 360 degree video as my primary medium of choice. Uh, for its almost limitless potential. And at the last uh, Venice Biennale, I presented a 360 degree work inspired by the trilogy Spheres by the philosopher Peter Sloterdijk, um, who came, um, you know, anyone who came to this um, Finnish research pavilion at the Venice Biennale had the experience of being immersed in virtual foam. So that was a, a new experience uh, spatially as well as um, tactilely uh, and sensorily. Um, in this case of the, um, the experiment uh, and the presentation, the use of the head mount mounted display technology to watch that 360 video offered up a proximal experience that was only possible with the technology and placed them, the experiencer of the performance in a performative space. So just before the foamings project, I was working with a bunch of colleagues of mine at the University of Waterloo on a digital set design, um, a digital sonography for an exclusively virtual reality project called The Home, which was trying to leverage virtual reality as a way to present the oral histories and reconciliation efforts of former residents of the Nova Scotia School for Colored Children which was just outside of Halifax and Dartmouth. 
This project is now going to be deployed into classrooms all across the province as a way to teach students about the histories of systemic racism in the province um, and as a way to um, uh, have some reconciliation from that. Um, it teaches about the past harms as well as the present harms and how we can move forward from that. Um, in the home, uh, the students are immersed in a virtual sonography, uh, a sonography of spaces where they navigate and encounter oral histories of the survivors, which blends computer generated 3D environments with 360 video shot on location and then in studio with maquettes or dioramas of different spaces in the home. Um, this project really made me think a lot about how these different spaces, the real um, and the virtual, uh, blend together and how these digital spaces have their own agency, if you will, in retelling the stories. Um, you know, it seems only natural that the project I co-created at the last Prague Quadrennial uh, called the Blue Hour VR combined all of these technologies then together and introduced um, uniquely real-time computer graphics or uh, real-time CG uh, and tactile environments then into the design mix. For me, this project uh, was a completely design-led experimentation, experimenting with form, with aesthetics, the body in space as a sensorium individually, and exploring our relationship fundamentally to the Anthropocene and the challenges and changing environment. Um, it was a way to go between, um, to radically reconceive the relationship between the spectator and the performer, placing them at the center of the performance event. So something that I'm focused on right now is exactly this, this kind of exploration of in-betweenness. Um, this is what I'm uh, thinking a lot about in my doctoral work at Alto University in Helsinki. It's how mixed reality performance design can navigate us to new ways of being and experiencing the world and the spaces that exist in the margins or in between real and virtual places. So um, in conclusion, I can only say that it is one of the most exciting times um, in a very depressing time, one of the most exciting times for designers to be exploring new technologies and to be investigating our relationship with these mediums. It's accessible, um, it's autonomous, and to really extend our perception of what design can offer and of performance and change the way in which we think and know the world that we live in. Thanks very much. That's what I got on offer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul. Um, You're very welcome. <laughs> uh, it's always great to catch up. You know, I, uh, one of the things that, um, one of the takeaways that someone could have from this is that if you start doing VR work, you're going to end up in the VS Biennale. Because I think I didn't realize that I, I knew that Ashley and Beth had collaborated on Pandora X, and uh, that um, myself and uh, through uh, Daniele Bartolini, um, we had contributed. Toaster Lab had con contributed to um, a piece that was there um, uh, this in the theater Biennale, and then. Mm. So um, there's an interesting exploration there. And also interesting because um, because of the current pandemic situation, they've changed uh, their programming for the extent, like it's no longer, um, what was that? There's a subdivision of the film festival, but they're no longer going to be holding it in person and are yeah. looking at hobbed ways of distribution um, as yeah. an, a way of adapting the festival yeah. moving forward. So there's something interesting that is like, yeah. um, um, with these festivals starting to present this, yeah. um, thinking about how it it unmoors it from a specific festival location. That's a great um, word considering it's Venice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about the liminality of the place and that there's this uh, continual transitory, and of course, as we all know, with sea level rise, there's an enormous change um, about mm -hmm. to take place in kind of the seat of, you know, um, at least, are, you know, Western artistic culture. So yeah, I don't know. That, that is, yeah. It's a strange place. <laughs> well, it's, it's it's interesting. Our our first uh, we had a piece in the festival, uh, the Future of Storytelling Festival in 2017, mm -hmm. which was like one of our first large pieces as Toaster Lab, and they didn't know how to tell people. Like it was site specific, and 
um, it was site specific and geolocated. Um, and so you had to go like find the immersive media and they like, they just yeah. couldn't figure out how to get the, the um, people direct, like the, the, um, the, the docents to direct people yeah. towards it. Cause it's like, it's this ephemeral thing you sort of have to do and then you can experience it, but there's not like a thing to go seek out. That's sort of freshness yeah. to it. Yeah. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. No, yeah. um, I'm going to um, bring us back to SB. Um, who's, uh, Ready again? Welcome back, Espy. I'll, I'll I'll turn it over to you. Our our you know our greed like smooth segues. Um, uh, who needs them? Um, uh, I'm really excited to have uh, you uh, presenting. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna, as I mentioned before, I'm going to be going through um, uh, different foundations that I have that's brought me into working in virtual and mixed reality um, recent projects as well as current explorations that I'm doing. So um, as was mentioned before, I am a sound designer and also a media designer. So I design visuals for live performance and between sound visuals moving into, well, um, currently have been in virtual working in virtual reality. In terms of virtual reality, I've been working in both cinematic and theatrical VR, um, working in a range from documentary to um, just regular film, um, theater plays, and um, coming up this year, moving more into music as some of my original visual workspace. Um, my early foundations was as a performer. So I did device theater, um, I, I did device performance and physical theater, um, singing, mask work. And I also, um, in my time at in undergrad, Jewett at Virginia Tech, I was part of the Linux Laptop Orchestra. Um, we had, um, we had used uh, very small Linux laptops, um, hemispheric hemispheric speakers, as well as Wiimotes and the checks attached to them to be able to trigger, trigger sound and be able to create gesture with that sound, to be able to shape that sound in a physical, in a physical form so that the audience um, could also be able to have a visual and um, a feeling attached to those sounds. So for me, sound, visuals, movement have all been intricately linked from the beginning. My first um, major VR project was Girl Icon, which was a documentary done in partnership with Oculus and Malala Fund and Milan Foundation in India. We went for two weeks um, and used um, focused on the um, using the 360 cameras. We focused on, um, at the time, 17-year-old Ronnie Kanauja. She was getting her education and looking at the different communities that were supporting her in that journey. So that ranged from the Girl Icon Fellowship that she was part of to the school, her family, as well as any other outside, um, outside mentorship activities. In this experience, what we did was we, we positioned the audience as a companion on the journey. We wanted Ronnie to be able to have her own space and have her own voice and um, move away from first person experience. Um, in this, in, in being able to be a witness and a companion to Ronnie's journey, we used a combination of um, a short, uh, short visuals um, back to back, as well as montages of various um, of various moments and Ronnie with her activities. Um, in these moments, we use the full 360 sphere and and cut, cut it up into pieces so that people could be able to watch the images flow in and out, as well as sound to be able to evoke a kind of memory. Um, we also had a physical exhibition at the National Civil Rights Museum in Atlanta, and so that provided a more um, more more physical entrance into the experience. Um, 
I had also, um, while working on Girl Icon, I had the um, opportunity to take part in Garage Stories, which is an ongoing workshop that introduces people into VR and different um, ways to be able to bring audiences into immersive storytelling. Um, we, um, we worked, we had a it was a comedy, and what we did was we worked with the actors in, into, into the, the setting was in two separate rooms, um, with the camera being on the cusp of where the two rooms would meet, and so, the, the comedy was about um, a couple that was about to get engaged and a severe misunderstanding and a proposal gone wrong. And based on what view you were looking in, you could be able to pick up what was happening in the story and be able to put together um, through context clues and physical cues, a slightly different narrative as to what exactly um, was, what, it, what the truth was of the scenario. We um, sat and we continued to do script work um, as we, you know, as we do um, in just regular theater and film and really allowing people to express nuance and to be able to not only not only um, express themselves in a not only be able to express themselves physically so that people can be able to understand the larger gestures at hand, but also be able to focus on particular nuances like the the way that a hand curves while putting um, lipstick on or being able to um, search for a ring. So these are very small details that people pick up and then be able to create an additional narrative in their mind and then be able to then piece together what was going on. Um, with Without You is a um, is an ongoing, going to be multi year project. Thank you, COVID. Um, is partially VR and partially AR. The AR audio visual installation focuses on the young focuses on a young girl who is separated from her mother and is caught up in the spiritual realm. And a VR experience focuses on both the daughter and the mother's story as they find their way back to each other. Um, part of the part of the intrigue in this experience is um, the order in which the order in which these pieces are meant to be experienced, um, looking at whether the VR experience can be, exper can, whether once things reopen, if the VR experience can happen inside the installation at large to be able to serve as a additional sculpture, um, as well as um, what understanding do people have while these two are experienced separately. Um, brief, uh, Beth, um, previously mentioned Finding Pandora X, so won't get too, too much into that, but I was a sound designer for that experience. And that entailed um, me going into the world and doing a site visit. Um, that is my avatar of choice. That is actually me waving to, it's actually me waving to Kira as she took a photo. And um, this was my first time working in a theatrical environment in VR, which still required physical presence, still required an understanding of scale, still required um, being able to understand how all of the design could work together and what people were what people were perceiving, what people assigned reality to and what were other things that they could suspend their disbelief and just um, go along with that fact. Um, as Beth had mentioned before, um, you know, there are a limitation of cues. I believe I had less than nine <laughs> to be able to work for the entire play. And so the focus was on the environment at large and then any prominent objects that were in the space. So for example, um, a torch that um, someone would be carrying that would have a sound, but the trees or footsteps that you're walking past, like those may not have um, a sound. Um, if there is a city and there's water and there's water flowing, um, to be able to heighten the sounds of the city and then maybe have water 
um, baked in underneath that, but not have that be a separate cue. And there are other, as I mentioned, other sounds that, um, like in a theater, not recreating everything to be hyper realistic, but being able to find um, more metaphorical and poetic ways to express sound. And this is this picture just gives a sense of the scale of the world that we were working with. So again, um, finding the balance between intimacy and also grandeur. Um, Black Imagination was the first VR play that I directed. Uh, that is me, my avatar. Uh, of choice, more customized to fit myself, um, but still always staying true to the purple and pink combination. Um, we, I worked with Crux XR, and for this, what we did was um, they gathered um, three writers and five actors, and so we all collaborated together to create a series of three plays. Um, this involved not only rehearsing the play and then actually performing it, but also um, considering what that onboarding process was like. Um, for instance, um, being able to um, understand the physics of the world by being able to interact with objects um, and then also finding ways to bring people into, um, into immersive spaces. Um, Zoom theater has also been, and I believe this might be the last thing I'll present. Um, so I did cinematography for that um, project and um, the not necessarily in a virtual reality environment, but um, coming back to um, thinking about accessibility and the resources that people have, um, we looked at um, this was the top top of the pandemic last year. So, in looking at this, finding out like what kind of angles people were able to do in their home, what kind of lighting they could do with their lamps or like a more of like a ring light, as well as um, for setting, um, looking into more traditional practices like models that set designers build and being able to um, incorporate that into the into the film. So, what is it like to be able to film the set? and then be able to then, inc what is it like to film film the set and also have a have a DIY feel to it, but still have something feel very um, immersive. Um, so in conclusion, oh, I didn't share sound, but there are subtitles, yes, there were. Um, so um, in, in conclusion, um, the, the design process that I've been looking at, um, design and directing uh, process that I've been looking at has been um, first thing, um, how, what does it mean to combine sound visuals and moving together, um, partially based on my backgrounds, but also just looking at um, what, also just looking at how to create a complete and immersive experience in VR. Um, and also just in terms of, um, in terms of like just the creative process, um, having regardless of all the pieces, whether it's something that's pre-recorded or it's a documentary 
or it's a film, you know, have continuing to have a sense of presence and like have that presence be highlighted and magnified. Thank you. Um, that's great work. I remember um, the first time reaching out to you, and I think that I put this in the email that I sent you to. It was, I got so excited when I saw somebody else that was taking pictures with the Insta360 Pro. Because uh, I like pose with it because it oh it's like a, having a little like robot alien with you all the time. Um, it's really hard sometimes to film with it be, uh, when you're like in public spaces because people are just like gonna walk up to it and sort of greet it. Yeah, I um it just a uh, fun factor. Um, I I give I give cameras nicknames uh, during filming partially to cut down on the technical jargon and just make mm -hmm. it seem a bit like more friendly instead of like, okay, now we're gonna use the Insta360 Pro with the with the um with the tripod. Um, we're gonna use CL. Um, <laughs> CL was the the sticker that they that the the studio bought. Um, I love that the, the thing. And then our 180 camera was Walla named after Wally. So like <laughs> even just like things like that, um, you know, giving them quirky names to be able to use um, also helps. Yeah, I, I love that too. Because I think about it, I think about um, like the especially on the filmic side, especially three D. So you end up with like lenses that have the parallax effect, so they're close. Like you end up with like eye contact, so that they become the thing that you're sort of performing to. So giving mm -hmm. them a personification is really um, uh, is really um, like. Like it makes a lot of sense from a performance standpoint as well of like like bringing this in because this is ultimately like your scene partner when you're when you're when you're staging things. Um, thank you. Um, th that's um, I'm I'm going to I'm gonna I'm gonna pick it up before we get to questions to offer some of the and we'll bring everybody back in a moment to offer a little bit about um, our toaster lab work. Um, I've got some slides too. Oop, come back thing. Well, it, this is only gonna work if I can, if it allows me to come back. There we go. All right, now I can actually share my screen. Here we go. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. All right. So, um, Right, this is a book, <laughs> it's not necessarily. So this is the basis for part of the way that Toaster Lab came into doing mixed reality work. Now, I'd say that like the basis for it is a little over a decade ago, we were having a conversation about a site-specific dance piece. Um, uh, and in um, and when we, uh, uh, I think that's my, there we go. Let my captions catch up. Um, we were, um, uh, when we were talking about the site specific dance piece, we were talking about archive and site specific archive. And wouldn't it be great if you could have a, like immersive um, record of dance happening in a place where you could place the dancer into the space in which it was happened if it otherwise wasn't accessible, like a historical marker. And that went down this road of like, well, could you do that with augmented reality? So you're overlaying it uh, with the environment. And that's sort of beyond the sort of like started down this road. But from like a, a dramaturgical standpoint, um, I always point back to the, um, the invention of moral. Um, which is um, uh, about this uh, convict who escapes um, uh, the law by going to this island. He's from Venezuela and he ends up um, uh, finding himself on this place where some sort of event happened and that suddenly he's not alone anymore and that there's a woman there that he quote unquote falls in love with. Obviously he's not interacting with her. So he's enamored with them. And so what he finds out is that there's actually this machine um, that is recreating the space and recreating this recording of people and it's captured them. So it's an immersive projection of that. And um, he inserts himself into it over the time. And, um, and this idea that um, virtual and augmented reality um, is really a set of, is not just a set of technologies, but um, uh, uh, an achieved state. Uh, so it's not even called that at first. I mean, if you got here, this is just Christopher Walken and Brainstorm, which is one of the first cinematic representations of a VR experience, which involves very few cameras. It's mainly about a mental state. But now we we stare into these things. Uh, our our VR um, cameras or lens 
boxes or a standalone headset to something that we put a cardboard box we put our phone into with a lot of different options. We do a lot of stuff filmically. These are some these are the old slide with a few different ways of approaching cameras, but they all essentially do the same thing. Um, in this case, the Ricoh Theta will take like two wide fisheye uh, lenses. Um, and get these like very wide shots. And then when you go and render it together, however many lenses you have, you get this echo rectangular, sometimes two echo rectangular, like a like a, when you project the globe onto a flat world map and stretch the lens out. And then you can play it as a photosphere. And so this is this player if you could turn around. That. So the, the experience for like when you're looking at this, if you put it onto something like YouTube, looks a bit like this, where you can like sort of drag it around and um, sort of look all around you. For it, but what we started trying to, what one of the places that we started was like, is there an accessible way for us to deal with this sort of content um, or mixed reality content? And it was like, well, can we get video? The YouTube app plays it, or we can get a player on the phone to play it. So we started doing. Well, let me advance with that. Sorry, man. This sort of experiment where we had. Um, pre-recorded video and would lock it into an oriented to a space so you could come back later. And this is this idea of technological haunting, right? So this idea um, that we could look at a place that has two different, very different realities um, and look at that at various points in time. Now we have an interest in environmental work. So like we look at like, as, a, as an example, like watching glaciers recede, right? So um, it's like uh, um, um, this picture of um, the Bear Glacier in Alaska over the period of uh, 85 years, right? Seeing it recede back. And this ex the way that these experiences change, you know, so that sometime, this is actually from a film uh, called Teneo uh, about Kiribati's mother um, and her only record of her experience there um, on uh, on the island where she was born is these VHS tapes. So some of our projects have included um, um, some different sort of community and remote work. So we've been working for a number of years on this project of Groundworks, the number of collaborators um, in Northern California. And this is, you can see Ross Kadi is both in his regalia doing our youth workshop. Um, here we're in a, um, uh, we're talking about uh, acorn harvesting um, with Bernadette Smith, uh, artist uh, at the Point Chester, uh, or no, Point Arthur. Manchester Band of Pomo Indians. And then um, here on the top of Kanimoto, a sacred mountain. And we're going around and looking at site specific ways of creating immersive experiences. And we also brought this home as well. Um, we're based here in Toronto. So we've done this ongoing project in Parkway Forest Park in North York, um, where we're working with youth to create VR stories around the park as well. So a lot of this is like doing theater workshops with kids and then giving them cameras and they're running around the park with them as well. And then uh, previously we had, we've done this um, and planned to do this last summer, but COVID got in the way. Um, we'll then have pop-up cinemas where we're sharing their VR films. And then once uh, those have been um, created, we then like have uh, create them and place them into this web app um, where someone can like explore the um, the park through geolocation and find these immersive um, uh, experiences. All about these different accessible ways of using immersive tech to understand place. We've done a, a, our projects vary a lot, and we've been going through this atelier project as well. Um, you know, just because it has a lot of things, we hold uh, we held the hackathon in June. People were looking at remote performance and using VR space as an augmented reality. We did a project in Philadelphia called Trail Off, um, which looked at user um, 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 instigated like uh, interactive storytelling that's geolocated. Uh, we contributed uh, a VR film piece that serves as the introduction, it's the rabbit hole to Daniel Bartolini's The Right Way at Venice this last year. Um, we just did a workshop with Theater Pass Mirai around, uh, in partnership with Cohort, uh, around looking at exploring augmented reality for captioning. And uh, Beth had pointed out PXR before, helped support this as part of our series of events that we were working on to bring people into VR space. Um, so we've got this team of people. Toaster Lab is, is this, at its core three people working together. Myself, I'm in blue there, blue and blue. Um, uh, and uh, working together to like find all these different ways of making the tech accessible. Like what are ways that people can get into it, um, making it, and solving not the question of what is the technology to use, but what is the right technology to get the experience that we want. And go back to that idea that we have of, we are trying to create an experience of place. And this is what led to the question of, uh, the question of, um, 
um, what is the type of experience we're trying to communicate? And can someone, can someone actually experience it? Because when we started out, we, um, we had these very severe technical limitations of augment, augmented reality in the way that we experience it through Pokemon Go or something like that even was very difficult. Um, and we worked on it for a long time trying to get dance content into that. And then it just got a lot easier. Um, but um, the way that people are using the devices that they have um, uh, uh, changes the way that you approach doing things. So it becomes less about like, am I going to build it in one way or another? It becomes more about what what do people have and how can we make it accessible to to them? And what is the type of experience that I'm trying to uh, to communicate? And so the basis of our work. Rapid fire. Um, I'd like to invite all of our our speakers, panelists back into the screen. That was a lot of different types of projects to throw at people. So I can only imagine that someone is watching something like, I have no idea where to start. I have even more. Um, my, my, my thought is to start with whatever you have. It's always to start with whatever you have and then start seeing what you can create from there. You can try, like if you get a new iPhone now, not that I'm suggesting anybody go get the, like drop the money on an iPhone, but like people have phones and now you can do like pretty good photogrammetry on a phone with, if you have since the iPhone 10 and then that sort of that same era with Android, you can do motion capture with the front facing camera like that you used to need to go rent a studio to do. Like so much of this is being built into devices that um, we either already have or like the Oculus headset now is, you know, cheap. We're gonna get into the ethics of the Oculus headset in a moment though too. Everybody's smiling because everybody has a knowing look of, of what exactly that means. Um, I, I had sent out a couple of early questions um, uh, to get us started, I, but I think, you know, one of them was like, what began your interest in work in extended reality work? And I think that we got to a lot of that. Um, and we, I'm sure that we're cover, especially people have, from the from the chat have specific questions about like essential skills or technology. So I wanna go right to the big question because um, I sort of alluded to it there. Um, uh, big, big tech, like right now, uh, the um, one of, uh, like if you're experiencing VR, very likely you are interacting with Facebook on some level. Um, and there are various things um, that I think that we've all had, we've all touched on now and we've all, all talked about it that like big tech is willing to accept some collateral damage um, for pushing the technology ahead, um, which is also a challenge for us to work together, right? We see uh, Timnet uh, um, Gebru, who just got dismissed from AI ethics at, uh, at Google. Um, for like speaking about how this might how this might uh, 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 move, how are we going to bring like in this pause? We've been dealing with a lot of issues around um, a post Me Too around not in our space here in Canada, where you know a lot of people are integrating the uh, the ad hoc assemblies voluntary addendum uh, around creating a more anti racist space. And we've all talked about assess accessibility. Uh, we've touched on sustainability and environmental issues. And Beth, you even got to the life-work balance. Okay, I'm surprised my kids haven't popped in here to say hello as well, because we're all working from now uh, from home here. How do we? How like? What are the concerns that you have? Um, and are there any things that you would like? Uh, how, any ways that you would like to address them with um, these sort of ethical questions that we may have backed ourselves into a little bit with? Um, being on on like a front wave of, of new technology that depends on big tech for advancement? It's a big question. I know you all have opinions about it because we've all spoken about it so many times. <laughs> um, well, I, I can go. Um, one of the, I think as we move into using um, um, immersive technology, more VR and AR and just all of the different components from it. Um, I think one of the dangers is to have all of that be bundled into one company, even if it wasn't Facebook. I think just the the very nature of where VR is, where, you know, we have, we had three Three off experiences where you know they're more mobile. You can't walk through them, but you can still look around and be immersed. To stand alone, where you have that immersive interact combination, and then the PC version, which is just like you just 
go all the way. And I think over the time, there's been a consolidation of what type mm. of headsets and experiences people want to have or the industry beliefs that people want to have. Mm. And while I appreciate that there is honesty in saying this is actually where we want to go as a company, I think it's important for everyone, artists, creatives, developers, to understand that at no point should there be all of like the entire field should be hinged on whether one company can succeed or not. Um, I know that people have their issues with, um, you know, with Facebook and privacy. And I also have a lot of concerns as well. Um, but I think part of that goes to this question of, well, what happens if these lawsuits pass through? What if, you know, they break up Facebook, then all of a sudden it break up a Facebook for people can mean the end of XR. And that's a huge jump that shouldn't even honestly shouldn't even exist. Um, even just things like Google going down means like you can't access all your emails and documents and like your whole business is shut down for, for however many hours. Like these are, these are concerns that I have in addition to the privacy and the ethics of each company. It's just that this, I, this move towards monopolizing, I think isn't that great. Um, mm. You know, in theater, we have, you know, just speaking for New York, we have Broadway, Off-Broadway, Off-Off-Broadway. We have regional theater, we have community theater, we have dinner theater. You know, there's, we have digital theater. There's all different kinds of theater. And I think in the same spirit, when everything closed with COVID, there was this understanding that regardless of what Broadway decides to do or regardless of what New York theater decides to do, um, funding aside, it shouldn't stop people from being able to create. We can talk about like who gets paid and how much and funding and all of those things, but just the ability to continue to create shouldn't be determined by just one unit of a whole. Um, even if it is the unit that may have more um, power and resources in the structure. So I think as we move forward in emerging tech, I want to encourage people to, you know, not only look at like hi-fi experiences like the the Oculus Quest or the Rift or all the other PC VR headsets, but, you know, if we can have more 3 off headsets, that, that'd be great. If people are able to have more experimental DIY stuff similar to how artists used to connect for sensors until mm -hmm. they were more, you know, commodified later. Like these are the things that are great. Even for AR, there's many different startups, apps, um, and even just like being able to now, now you're able to scan with, with your phone or device. Um, it may not be like a complete hyper-realistic um, representation, but I think with all the media that we consume, that not everybody wants that, and st story-wise, it doesn't always work. So right. these are these are things that are on my mind. Yeah, thank you, Beth or Paul, or Beth or Paul want to go first because I know that you both have an answer to this question. <laughs> um, yeah, I can go. Um, there's it's so complex, like. Um, in thinking about re very recently, like we're we're seeing the impact of these these um, mega corps um, and what they're doing to the progress of this world. So this virtual extended reality world. Um, so the wave what was had a VR presence um, and was doing a lot of really interesting work in terms of live performance um, and creating immersive. Uh, work and live performance, but it was all built off of Google Poly, and with the the with Google removing their support and essentially dissolving Google Poly, the Wave is no longer able to continue um, because they are a for-profit corporation, and and it doesn't work with their business model to now have to build a whole uh, a substructure to support their continued development. And this brings up some really interesting questions around. Um, I may mean, I have five million thoughts, but around open source um, platforms and 
that being part of how we look at accessibility going forward because so much is proprietary. I think headsets and stuff will get there. We'll, we'll either see a resurgence in like the cardboard versions of things or we'll be able to start hacking some of that stuff and we maybe Facebook won't take over and not everyone's gonna have a quest and things will come. I'm, I'm hopeful around that, but it's, it's these platforms that are all built on other um, structures and mm. in looking at like, is there a way for, to, to create open source hardware? Is there a way to create open source um, software? And so that we, uh, the we, the greater we of the globe continue to be able to access these things um, without it being driven by, by profit margins. Um, and, you know, I don't, I have ideas about how we can do that. I think it, I think the artists too, um, one of the things when we were talking about this at PXR was like, you know, so Facebook runs Oculus and there are all these issues with it and we sort of have to look at getting at the system from within. So how can we use some of these platforms now to learn what we need to learn in order to, to create our own systems, particularly as artists who aren't driven by the profit model of a gaming company or a, or a film studio that, that we, we may be looking at it in a slightly different way. So I think incorporating that too into, and I know it's part of projects that I'm working on, that development of open source, this way of sharing, um, building another approach to, to this so that we, mm -hmm that prioritizes accessibility, right? Because that's not prioritized in any of those companies in any way, shape or form. No, and in multiple ways too. I know one of the things that as well, like one of my sticking small points that I use as an example is just the way that they determine, like there's a limited range of pup uh, pupil distance that can be accommodated by headsets. And like they went from having like a fixed one on the go to like a slider on the quest within a range to like three preset right? that it's like an acceptable tolerance between those. And like those sort of things, it's a, like the various photo sensors in it that are tracking lots and lots of our bio data, but their ability to recognize different skin tones and know that somebody actually has a headset on is highly problematic. Like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things uh, that get into that sort of collateral damage that I'm talking about that they're like, well, you know, the headset's profitable enough. But, it, and, and SP, as you mentioned, like the, uh, like having the technology, the fact that there's no support for the Go anymore, the Oculus Go, which was a three DOF headset um, uh, um, that had one controller, so it had limited use. And instead of advancing that as a way that people could get introduced to things, um, they just killed it. And so now there's a bunch yeah. out there that are really useful for things like VR cinemas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, hey everyone, just riffing on that concept of accessibility, we had a question from one of our listeners. Um, the question is, I'd love to hear thoughts on how mixed reality artists or organizations are or are not serving accessibility for both audiences and artists to participate in these technologies, especially in rural communities. I'm really curious who asked the question because I'm wondering. There's like one person that I, I that uh, I might end up misquoting them that they could have very well been the person to ask it. Um, oh no, it's not the person that I thought it was. Anyway, uh, um, and often I'm the one to ask that question too. Well, I'm thinking <laughs> of like so the the toaster lab the hackathon that we did in June was based on this like low bandwidth areas question. Um, uh, and talking about yeah, the, the thing that comes to mind is like thinking about data infrastructure. We were working with Nakai Theater and thinking about data infrastructure and the Yukon and the ability to get high speed anywhere, even in the middle of Whitehorse, is difficult and limited. And like having these plans to have like 5G drones it feels very, cons it feels very cute. Um, um, but like 5G drones flying, so you can get the data coverage to actually. They actually uh, do those the do those sort of things, um, yeah. Paul, you're actually tethered right now. Yeah, I'm tethered. Um, <laughs> yeah, so and I seem to have the best bandwidth. So <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's a really you know as everyone said, um, it's a really complicated question, isn't it, about accessibility? 
um, we're already speaking at a rather privileged level, uh, you know, in, in so many aspects, whether it's geographically, locationally, or whether it's just with our pocketbook. These technologies cost a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one, um, one interesting maybe component is that as these large platform models, these Facebooks, you know, they, they, they you know, they're doing two things at the same time. They're, you know, they're making it profitable, they're pushing out the technology, they're making it therefore more democratic in terms of accessibility. This is a slow process and I wouldn't say that maybe it's their highest priority, of course, um, but, it, but, you know, we can look historically at where we started in terms of the accessibility of these technologies and it's a completely different landscape. Um, you know, a, a lot of what I wanted to focus on in my talk was really about um, saying that there is an, a, a a, a strata of accessibility at this point with the technology that didn't exist five years ago. Now technology moves so quickly um, that it's you know it's it's almost impossible to imagine um, you know where we're going to be in five years. But we know that all of us are using things that we never used to use before, or even we're using things in terms of 360 camera capture that that is not prosumer or that's not pro gear, but it's doing the function that we need it to do. Um, that is accessible to us at this point that wasn't there even five years ago. So that's already a shift in terms of like market dynamics for, you know, having uh, small mixed reality companies or small companies enter the playing field on one level. Um, but, you know, with with all good things, there's, um, you know, there's the converse and uh, the, you know, we, we have we see the same thing. We have a lot of people who are left out of the playing field. Um, left out certainly in VR, and, and I think there's a different kind of level of discussion that we could have in terms of what specific technologies we're talking about too. So it's it's very different for VR. Um, I mean, I I don't. You're right. I'm rural. Um, there's not much support. Nobody really cares out here, um, and uh, there's no way I can uh, I can run a VR system out out here or create with it. I have to be in a in an urban environment that has high high speed internet access. So. So there are some major barriers as well to to creation, depending on the platform. So, yeah. And and I want to throw I throw out the idea to help some people also think about this technically. That one of the reasons that um, there's been the recent ex explosion in available headsets is for the say like uh, if you think about it, positional sensing, locational sensing, mm. high density displays. That's like before the ago came out, you or or the explosion of recent headsets, you would have said I'm talking about a mo like a smartphone, and a lot of the development in smartphones, like essentially the Oculus mm -hmm. devices, the standalones are Android phones, uh, modded to be what they uh, what they are, so that there is there there should be a capability of starting to run things like if we're talking about mobile mobile infrastructure. Um, but the, the ecosystem also has to be open enough to allow people to figure those problems out. On um, on some of our projects with Toaster Lab, we've had to come up with a packaging system so that people can download things before they go on site to, to things and do it in a way that conserves their data in the background. Because uh, that's the last thing that you want is for someone to like be doing a remote streaming performance uh, through 360 and not have the data because it's data intensive because it has to be fairly high resolution to do it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. On that tech end, there's another question from the chat mm -hmm. here. If I wanted to live stream a theater performance using a 360 degree camera, what kind of technical equipment and considerations should I factor into a project budget? Hey, Beth, you want to talk about Prague? Uh, Beth and I failed miserably to live stream a, <laughs> an event. We tried, uh, tried though. We tried yeah. for no for no lack of trying. So a lot of the th dedicated 360 cameras do have the ability to live stream, um, but uh, without. Um, I'll grab a visual reference if somebody else wants to ju uh, jump in here. I've got got one nearby, so you can sort of see one of the limitations is that you you just don't have a screen to see what you're doing, right? So the interface is limited. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Beth, what happened when we were in Prague? I'll, I'm going to get a device to share. Sure, yeah, what happened? I mean, we had set ourselves up with lots of time. I mean, it was Ian and I working on it, so we had the knowledge in the room. Um, we had a pretty robust internet connection, so that was check. Um, we had the right equipment, so that was also check. Um, we had... Um, 
we had all the pieces there. And what we ran into, uh, and Ian will remember specifically what it was, but we couldn't get YouTube to, to like, we couldn't actually get the stream out in a way that anyone could see it. So we had all the pieces, um, but then the it was YouTube that had updated something and we it, it had worked and then it didn't work. And we tried a whole bunch of different end runs around it. Um, and we spent a fair bit of time, several hours, um, trying to make it actually work um, and, and just couldn't. And that was really ultimately nothing on our end because we had all the pieces and the know-how. Mm -hmm. um, but it was the greater the greater gods <laughs> of, <laughs> the of reality. Yeah, we had the we had enough bandwidth in both places. So this is I brought down. This is actually both a 360 and a 180 camera. This is the Fuse XR camera. So it folds together and works as a make sure my camera's being reversed. Um, that it works as a. It's got two lenses on the side, so you can do monoscopic 360 on it, and then it flips out like like that so you can do stereoscopic 180 but you might notice there's not like a screen or anything on it like so you can tether it to your phone um to like preview it but even when you're recording you can't kind of do it you're meant to with a lot of these devices one of the technical limitations is actually being able to see it or interface with it and so that also means it's hard to bring it into other devices and they're meant to be like in your pocket too so one of the limitations that we ran into and uh, like Beth, you mentioned, there was like YouTube changed something just so it was happy with the data stream. They were sending it. And on the other side, it was like mm -hmm. on a university Wi-Fi network. So it was running into firewall issues um, because you had to like connect to the streaming service directly from the camera. And you had like three buttons by which to select what network you were on and to put in a standard uh, Wi-Fi code to it. And then at the end of it, after like four hours, we're just like, this might not work. And you get like, if, if you're used to the current Zoom performance delay of 20 seconds for live streaming, you get like 30 seconds and up. Yeah. Even on a high speed connection, you need to sub, you need to send at least 4K, yeah. which is high for streaming as it is because um, anything less than that is not, yeah, you need really high bandwidth to be able to yeah. get um, both on the up and down for the viewer um, too, because yeah. the, Sounds yeah. like the moral of the story is that you have to test, test, prototype, and test, and still it might not work. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. we were aiming for interactivity too, right? It was a dialogue that was back and forth between Prague and Kingston, Ontario, and, and it just just couldn't do it. Yeah, but yeah, test, test, and then test again, and then be prepared when something changes somewhere and the whole thing goes sideways. But also to know that, you know, if you get it working, that this is pretty high stakes, that you'll there be you one go. of the first to really make it happen. So, <laughs> yes. you know, it might be worth putting that investment in. Yeah. yeah. I know. It's, a, it, it's a question of what you need uh, in terms of the project as well. So sometimes we, we think like, oh, we need the latest whatever. But actually, does it serve the project? Is it dramaturgically relevant? Or can you actually do it in another way um, that's still very similar, just because perhaps the technology or the budget isn't quite there? And so like, I love SB, your presentation, like, uh, like the kind of going back to the roots of analog paper and pen and you know, you know, stop animation effects. Like, I, I think we all, as creators and as mixed reality, creators, we're all trying to think about what we actually need to convey the story or convey the dramaturgy at the time. So that's just something to think about. Yeah. Thank and you. Also, just uh, one uh, short note, um, in these efforts of live streaming, uh, Ethernet cable is your friend. Um, in these instances, Wi-Fi, um, <laughs> totally you know, we all talk about, you know, having Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi is the thing to do. But um, during this pandemic time, uh, we've realized that, you know, actually being hardwired in is a good solid way to go. Yeah, our Wi-Fi stuff right there. Espy, I have a follow-up question for you because this is somewhat mm -hmm. related. Um, 
uh, and thinking about like the limits of the camera interface too, and thinking about your like the filmic work as well. I know that because we've done, um, and and Paul, you may want to hop in on this at some point as well. But in recording things in three hundred and sixty, especially with some cameras and like the limitations of preview and how close you get, far you can actually get from the camera, because essentially the only way to see it is to like use a very small Wi-Fi network with your phone, and you might as well be standing next to the camera when you do it. Um, one of the limitations that we've experienced is that you sort of have to trust your understanding of the equipment to get the footage that you want because you're never going to see it until like you've had a chance to like go back to your computer and then spend a lot of time actually rendering it. Um, what has been your your sort of experience or best practices with using uh, the camera to shoot things and what level of trust do you put in the technology? Um, so a few things. Um, when we filmed Girl Icon, not only did we have the Insta360 Pro camera, but we also had a um, one of those clip-in uh, 360 cameras for your phone. So in an effort to, you know, again, being that we were um, we were filming in India, we were filming in Varanasi, very busy, <laughs> very busy city, as well as like just a lot of different a lot of different things happening around us. Even moving to um, film at Ronnie's home, we didn't want to have such a disturbance of setting the camera up, shuffling it around. No, that doesn't work. Let's carry it. Let's go somewhere else. So what we did was we attached a small camera to my phone and that was how we scouted for a spot. So if I can see it on my very, not as not as great quality, I think it's great. Uh, not as uh, wonderful quality as the larger camera. If I can see it on my phone, I can definitely see it with six lens. So we would just take a scan, just kind of walk around. Okay, I can see everything as eye level. I kind of want to, you know, have it at this particular point. Okay, now we're gonna set the camera up here. And then also because of the heat, we were only able to, between the heat and then the fan that would interfere with sound, we can only film 15 minutes at a time. And that's like pushing it. So it really was like eight to 10 minutes at a time. So when we were filming, we, we were also like, it was a very strategic process. Little baby 360 camera, find a shot, set up camera, um, briefly look at the um, interface. And when you're looking at the mobile, see what's around and where's a good place to hide. Um, and then go hide there when you're when we're actually doing the, the larger one and to just film in short um, spurts as to not um, as to not cause too much of a disturbance. We would film extended over short spurts and so people would just, you know, get accustomed to this object being here and continue about their day. Um, but that was that was a, a, an important part of the process was to be able to look at it in, in that way. Yeah, I know um, for our uh, our projects, essentially, like for our crew, it's essentially like you play Where's Waldo? Like if you look mm -hmm. around, you can start to see the same people's jackets turned away from the camera when we're out in space. It's like, yeah. there's nowhere else to go or you're gonna burn a minute of footage while everybody plays hide and seek yeah. uh, outside there and things. There's actually one one more thing uh, to forget um, that I forgot. So um, oftentimes in VR, we talk about field of view, like it's a bad thing. Um, oh, this headset only has 90 degrees of field of view, or this one has 60, or this one has whatever. So um, due to particular visual um, vision in, uh, limitations that I have, my field of view is actually not as wide as other people. So I, when I'm filming in 360, like I rely on that field of view to actually set a frame. And I understand that like, as I'm setting this frame, you know, what's that composition within that? And then if I turn, what is a new composition um, that is before me? So mm -hmm. just also taking a look at, um, you know, understanding that we're filming in 360, but also understanding that um, as as people moving in every day, um, there are times that we are like constantly looking around and seeing what's around. But once you get a sense of your environment, um, 
there tends to be particular points of focus and mm-hmm. everything else that's around you informs, you know, where you are and just reaffirms that you're in that space. So picking like what that initial frame of focus is and then figuring out like what other frames of focus are with the very small camera and then knowing that when we're filming that these are particular points that people would look at. Yeah. I, I actually might use a, a, a pause at quick. Oh, I was just, yeah, very brief. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to totally say what well, everything you said is, is brilliant. I, I, I think it's really about knowing your technology, like any kind of d- design field, like we're just, you need to become so familiar with that piece of technology that you, you know, you know how it's going to respond in whatever condition. And one thing that we often leave out um, is just the, and, and this goes about, but this goes into knowing your technology, which is knowing the timelines of the technology. So although it's true, you might be able to, as we all know, this particular camera can do this kind of thing and I can entrust without that view, it will do what I want it to do. But sometimes you just need to be able to do a lot of prototyping and test shots and take it back. And so I, I got into a lot of, yeah, I, I, ca- I capture a lot of um, nature imagery, especially for the projects that I was telling you about. And and so that tends to be um, needing for needing me to take long sequences as well, because I'm interested in the duration, um, the time duration. Uh, and and so then uh, in order to render a process that just to see if it's if the test footage is worthy, uh, it takes a long time. So I'll I'll end up capturing small segments just to see and then going away to render it and, and taking a look and then trying to come back to that same thing. But but it does just require a significantly different kind of um, uh, time. Uh, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, I feel time. like I, I often refer to one of the things that helped me most in preparing to work with the, the cinematic side of VR is having been trained how to do like traditional film uh, photography and not being able to see it until you've processed it and being able to like, how do you frame a shot and how do you trust your equipment to know it well enough because of your experience um, yeah. with limited resources and limited, in this case, space and time to be able to do that. Um, yeah. I did want to use that as like a moment because we're, we're, we're coming up on time. I feel like, I feel like yeah, just, Aaron's, Aaron's here for that. It, yeah. <laughs> that, that we just came right past it because I think that actually there's like a really, like there's a really good point uh, point here that I, I want to pull out of uh, actually what you were both saying, um, especially what you were just uh, saying, SB, and sort of thinking about it as like, we're talking about uh, something that is uh, very cinematic and screen-based and technology-based and We've also talked about like a wide variety of technologies that like you could do it with like a little thing that you clip onto your phone, a giant camera, or you're gonna render it in like a VR uh, social space or like build a whole VR video game. Like all of those span the gamut of the type of work that we're doing and and, and sometimes overlapping in a number of different ways. And we need to talk about all the different approaches ad nauseum. In fact, we are all part of a two-year project of having those discussions in an ongoing way. So we definitely could talk about it. Uh, um, but I think I, what I wanted to do as we're closing out is pull it back to, it is a design practice too. And there's something, SB, that, that that as you were describing it, one of the things that I, I, felt, I felt early on in approaching this was like, all of these 360 camera makers are going to people who use cameras who are used to framing and that it's, but then, and, and so many of those are unsatisfying because they're not thinking about, they're not adjusting their field of view. They're like here, and then other stuff's happening. Um, and that ultimately that practice, it's, it's like recorded performance because it actually has to think about what the entire environment is. Like it is a scenographic practice to think about everything that's around you, whether or not it's virtually created or cinematically recorded, whether or not it's 3D or 2D, whether or not you're looking at it on a headset alone or um, working it on a, on, a, on a phone device or whatever device you're looking at it. It's ultimately about like organizing space and then using technology to sort of collapse different times into into one place together. Um, uh, that I think yeah. is exactly why this has been my argument for designers coming into this world because we understand orally and visually from a scenographic point of view, from a people movement point of view, we get that organization of space, whether it's physical or sound. Um, and we under we it's in our training, it's in our craft, it's in what we do. 
to direct attention and to really, really think about the 360. Even if we've ultimately framed it in a proscenium, we still get it. We, we, we have spent our lives developing those dimensions and understanding of, of those spaces. And so it's why this place, certainly for me, has always felt really familiar from starting with projection and moving into VR. And it's why I try to bring people in because then they come in and they go, oh yeah, no, I took like it, it makes sense. I'm standing in space, I'm crafting space um, in all the different ways we do it with light, with sound, with shape. And so I think that's a really critical and key and super exciting place to be. Well, we're over. We are. I think that's an excellent place for us to wrap up. Um, we're Absolutely. all around everywhere. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Erin, to cut us off. Just cut us off because we're- <laughs> we, we'll just keep going. Is, this is what we do when we get together. We just talk about this ad nauseum. Yeah. Well, I'm so grateful to all of you for your energy and for this discussion, for this ongoing conversation. Um, and I like the spirit that the, you know, the conversation continues and that we don't feel like we wanna stop because in fact, this afternoon, we are hosting a round table discussion about this topic. So if you are watching now and you have more questions or you wanna know more, you wanna engage more with this subject matter because of the broad nature of this topic, we are doing another event, which is a round table to discuss um, VR, AR, beyond reality uh, topics where you'll get to engage with your fellow attendees and speak at length um, with fellow attendees about the concepts that we discussed here today. So um, a big thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, Emily, maybe we can show the four of them again. Um, thank you so much to Beth Cates, Paul Sigis, SB Proctor and Ian Garrett. And thank you especially Ian for moderating this panel as well. Um, I'm so grateful to have the four of you here, really forefronter, for, forerunners, not only in the Canadian ecology of Beyond Reality, but also internationally. So we're really honored and grateful to have you here and to hear your wisdom and to hear your thoughts on this, particularly not just from the technology perspective, but as this is the dramaturgy of digital performance symposium that we're also hearing from you as artists, that we're hearing from your perspective as creators um, is really significant to me and hopefully to the people attending. So thank you very much. I'll do a